I remember the first uh, video game company I started, um, some of my partners, my mom were asking, well, what's your goal? What are you trying to do? And I said, well, I want to make enough money with this game that I earn the right to make another one. Right? And I see the same, way, I see the same thing with apps. Um, and I thought it would be really good to give you a little bit of perspective just to give you a little bit of history of, uh, of who I am and where I come from. So I have been doing this for a while. I started my first interactive design company in 1989, which was 26 years ago. So um, I've run three companies, um, and Presto Studios, sort of being a middle company, I ran for 11 years, and that's where Mark and I met. Uh, so I do come from the, from the days of CD-ROM, and 8-bit color, and 12 and 13-inch monitors, and all the rest of it. And Ocean House Media is the current incarnation of what I happen to be focused on. Um, we're an independent studio. We've not taken any outside money. That's important because it allows us to do what we want to do. We don't have to answer to anyone at the corporate level or at the investor level. It takes a lot of pressure off and it gives us the ability to be creative. We're entering our seventh year of being in business. We've had hundreds of millions of app launches, tens of millions of uh, 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 downloads. Um, most proud of is that we've been able to build a business that's been growing based on cash, and we've been profitable every year for those seven years, including the first year of 2009. So to give you an idea, uh, this was our first app. This was, this was our volley into the space to see if it could actually work. Is there a market here? Um, last night I talked a little bit about niche markets and the importance of really going micro niche in what you're doing. We designed a Tibetan bowl simulator. There's not a lot of competition in the Tibetan bowl simulator market. I like to believe it's because we put the best Tibetan bowl simulator in the entire world on the app store and no one wanted to compete with us. <laughs> Now we laugh and we joke, right? It probably is the best-selling Tibetan bowl simulator on the App Store. <laughs> but who's laughing if I tell you that we created the app in 51 days for almost zero budget, we've sold 70,000 copies and grossed $140,000 on a Tibetan bowl simulator. Okay, it kind of puts things in perspective. It's still selling. Right? We'll probably still be selling this another 10 years from now. Right? So it, it kind of, it, when you really stop and think about it, there's something really, really powerful about that. Now, of course, we're not known for our Tibetan bowl simulator business. What we're really known for is the work that we've done for uh, Dr. Seuss and a lot of other major licensed partners. There's two sides to having a big brand. Right? There's the obvious good side, that you get a lot of brand recognition, you can get a lot of visibility, and there's a lot of familiarity. It also comes with a lot of baggage, and Warren was alluding to this a little bit. Um, the first one is that we're trying to adapt linear media to an interactive format. Um, and there's certain things you can do, sometimes things are done very, very well, like with the, uh, the Caterpillar app we just saw, and there's a lot of apps that just don't do it. You know, it's not just a matter of taking a book and, and translating it straight across. Um, the other thing is a lot of times the licensed partners don't want any major changes to what was there. So that, that could be tough. Um, and then finally, there's of course the market expectation piece. But even working within these constraints, we've been able to develop 400 apps in the last uh, six and a half years. So, so currently we have 412 apps on the Apple App Store. Google, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Samsung, and all the other stores are on top of that. So all combined, we're currently managing about 1,000 SKUs on the various stores around the world. We have paid apps, we have paid me apps, we have free apps, we have freemium apps, we have subscription apps. We're basically trying everything. We're on Amazon Free Time, we're on Amazon Fire TV, and we're always talking to partners to see what's coming next. We've done over 200 digital book apps. Um, I thought it was really interesting last night when Dylan from uh, Tokoboka was saying that there was a time that they were trying to figure out where they were going with their business and they started walking through toy stores. Well, Karen and I, when we started this business, we did the exact same thing. We just walked through bookstores. 
So, you know, we literally had a yellow pad of paper and walked through Barnes & Noble in spring of 2009, mm -hmm. right? Long before the iPad was ever announced. And we said, yeah, that'd be good on a mobile device. That'd be really cool on a mobile device. That'd be cool on a mobile device. And we made a list. And that was my hit list of who I had to contact in 2009. And thankfully, we were able to establish some really great partnerships. We've been blessed. We've been really fortunate. Um, Inc. recognized us in uh, 2013 for being the 114th fastest growing company, private company in the U.S. Uh, good and bad with that. Um, but it was, uh, it was nice to recognize. So I thought it would be great to go into a little bit of market conditions and give you an idea of how I see the space. Um, the first thing is the number one word that comes to me is flooded. Flooded, 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 as in where Texas is right now. Um, you know, for Apple, it's fantastic. There's over 1.5 million apps on the App Store. For everyone in this room, I think it's actually pretty bad, pretty horrible. I, I think if you do the math on it, it's something like 1,000 new apps per day that are coming into the space. That makes it really, really hard to get above the noise. Um, and what it, what's created is it's created a ridiculous level of oversupply. And we're starting to get into some real economics one-on-one -on -one with this. Um, when there are so many products and so many good products, not saying they're all good products, obviously, but just when there's so many products, it becomes really hard to stand out. And if you think back to economics, in a market where you can't stand out, the only real way to compete is on price. And it's exactly what we're seeing happening. Um, lots of people are doing this, and it's bringing the whole market down. And from my perspective, I don't see that changing anytime soon. Right? I'm starting to change my thinking about all of that. So, um, you know, basically, with a monopoly, you've got a structure where there's really only one producer, one seller of a product, and everyone's locked in and they can set the price, right? The opposite of that is what you call perfect competition. And in perfect competition, there's lots of sellers, lots of products that are similar in nature. Anything can be substituted. You raise your price, and people are going to look elsewhere. And there's really few barriers for companies to come in. As the tools are getting easier and easier, the barriers coming way down, it's just where we're at. It's the reality of the market. And to come into the space without acknowledging that fact um, would be like coming in with blinders on. So my, a couple of my own personal beliefs. My personal belief is that the new shiny factor of tablets and phones and touch screens is over, right? There was a time when it was cool and you had to have it and as soon as you got it, what's the first thing you did? You downloaded a whole bunch of apps, right? What can I do? Blah, 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 right? Just my personal belief, but it's also looking at the patterns of my own family. We are not downloading anywhere near as many apps as we used to, right? We're just not. Um, and I think, that, you know, if you look at other markets to really reinforce this, you can look at the first time you bought a VCR, the first time you bought a CD player, the first time you bought a PlayStation. It's in those early days that you load up on all the content, and then your usage starts to drop off with time. You're, you're purchasing, right? And that's exactly where we're at. The tricky thing is that at that early rush, when the thing, when it first comes out, and I'll use CD-ROM as an example, being back in the day, and Mist came out, right? And then Mist all of a sudden explodes and sells like seven or eight million copies. And everyone says, I can go do that. I'm going to go do a Mist club, right? So now you have a double factor working against you that people are buying less and everyone's trying to do it, and everyone's spending way too much, right? It's just the reality of the market. And then this is what it ends up as. And I don't actually think that discoverability is the problem. I think the problem is that people have app overwhelm. Right? It's not a question of how do I get SpongeBob or whatever's behind SpongeBob up in front of this child. The question is, how many apps does this child really need to have? How many apps do they need to learn their ABCs, to learn their 123s, to learn their whatever it happens to be? Right? It just, it just doesn't matter. 
So why buy more? Right? I mean, my, my kids, look, my girls each have an iPad. I've got 100, 150 apps on each one. Warren sends out his newsletter. There's fantastic apps coming out. How many more do they need, right? So even I, being in the business, have to admit that I'm not downloading as many as I used to. And I do think that it's become extremely difficult for the parents to tell good from bad. I get so many emails from people saying, you're in the app business, what should I download? And I'm like, really? You know, there's got to be a place to go find this stuff, right? Um, and then it dawned on me. I just don't believe that people are doing a lot of research to find which $2.99 product they're going to buy. I just don't. I think they're asking their neighbor, or I think they're asking a teacher. Right? And, and so it's really dawning on me that we are in a word of mouth business. And we may like to think otherwise, but it really is at the core just a word of mouth business. All right, so I do think that there are a couple of secrets to being successful in the app store. The trick is, they're not really secrets at all, and people already know them. I think what it is is people just want to ignore them. And so maybe I'm here to just sort of do a, do a wake-up call to say we cannot ignore the market forces. You cannot ignore the economic conditions. The first balance that needs to be nailed in order to be able to survive and live in this space is that it is critical that costs have to be kept down. Costs have to be kept down to an absolute minimum while you have to figure out a way to get buyer value of your product and a differentiation higher. It's not that I'm just doing another ABC app. Why is my app different? And it's not just 10% different. Why is my app 5, 8, 15 times better than every other product that's out there teaching the same thing? And how do I do it at a fraction of the cost? Working both ends of that yardstick, for lack of a better word, I'm probably not hitting the right one, are really what it's what it's critical, what, what, what has to happen. So um, that's one balance. The second balance is related to marketing. There is a cost to acquire a new customer. It's important to know what that cost is. The cost of acquiring a new customer has to be substantially less than what you're able to get in terms of customer lifetime value from that customer. Did you right? say that again? There's a cost to acquiring a customer. It's the acquisition cost. The cost to acquire that customer must be substantially less than the amount of revenue you're going to generate, the customer lifetime value, right? If you think about it, it's logical. But if you look at the way that money's being spent today, it's not, right? The, the cost today, to, to if you do paid advertising, if you want to buy an install, I'm not talking about a paid install, what I'm saying is if you want to advertise on Facebook or whatever it happens to be, to get someone to download your free app, it's going to be between $1.80 and $3 to get an install of the free app. And then it starts to get into how many of those free app downloads am I going to be able to convert into paid app customers. And that math doesn't really start to work at $3, $2, $4 price points, right? <clears throat> These are the challenges, right? Everyone in this room, I mean, yes we're, yes, we're app designers, but we're also entrepreneurs or appropreneurs. And understanding the, the market dynamics are what's important. And these are the challenges that need to be solved. And here's what's happening that I see. I believe that people are burning money in this space. And I believe that they've been burning it left and right. Number one, I think people are putting way too much money into production. In a lot of cases. I'm generalizing here. Um, I, my personal belief is that it's, it's very, very difficult to spend forty, fifty, hundred thousand dollars some of these budgets that I'm hearing in an app, and then expect it to get a decent ROI. I can tell you we are nowhere near those numbers for app creation. 
Um, and I believe that people are spending way too much money on what it costs to acquire a customer. Um, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. Um, there's a lot of venture capital firms now that are being very, very clear. If you're asking us for money as a way to expand our to expand your user base, and that's the reason you're going to get the money, then we will not fund you. You have to find another way to get the users in, other than we're just going to do paid content or whatever it happens to be. So the tricky thing is, a lot of uh, investors and a lot of VC companies, um, they'll give up money. To, 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 they'll make an investment, but if the money gets spent on either high development costs or high acquisition prices, I believe that's just sort of a slow motion train wreck waiting to happen. Um, so, so a lot of people come to me and say, I have a great app idea. I, I, I don't know. I thought, hey, look, if I had a dollar every time someone said that to me, I could probably stop making apps. Okay? Um, and oftentimes, the first question I will ask is, that is awesome that you have an app idea. How are you going to market it? And people say, well, I don't know. I mean, that's, you know, I, I, the app is going to be so great that Apple's going to feature it. Okay, that's one possible route. Or we can go to Vegas. Um, but I think that without understanding how the marketing is going to happen for an app, almost before you start production, is sort of putting the cart before the horse. Right, there's a reason we went after brands for brand awareness. We knew that we were going to get it through organic search. We knew we were going to get low cost customer acquisition because of the products we were building and it all tied in together. Um, and maybe I should apologize right now. I hope I'm not going too businessy with this, but you know, this is the hat that I wear. Right? I have very, very good interactive designers that work for me and programmers and all the rest of it. But someone's got to steer the business ship, and this is this is what I do. Um, the app market is evolving. We knew so. My pitch to Dr. Seuss when I went in, and we, you know, so not a lot of people know the story. Maybe one of these days I'll write a book, and maybe next time I come I'll tell the story of how Dr. Seuss went digital because I started a bunch of notes as well. But when we got the Dr. Seuss rights, we actually, um, we were competing against Random House and other companies. And our pitch was, this is software. And software is not static. You're not just going to publish a book or an app and put it out once and be done with it. It's going to need to be updated. There's going to be user issues. There's going to be new hardware. There's going to be new features. There's going to be things that are going to evolve. This was the pitch of why we were a better more appropriate, nimble company to deal with. Um, I'll tell you that even I didn't see the amount of updates that were going to be required. Remember, we have a thousand live SKUs on the store today, right? So we've had to figure out the process of how to make this all work. Uh, people don't realize that Cat in the Hat's actually gone through three complete evolutions so far. We've gutted and rebuilt the engine three times, and later I'm going to show you the fourth one that we've been working on for the last year. So, um, constant investment in innovation and keeping up with where the market is, um, and that also needs to be part of the business plan. If, if an app is not designed with the thought of how are we going to keep investing in it and how are we going to keep um, updating it, it is doomed to eventually end in the zombie app wasteland. So the current stat right now is that 83% of all apps on the Apple App Store are zombies. And the definition of a zombie app is an app that does not appear on any ranking chart anywhere in the world at least two out of every three days in a year. Right? 83% of the apps on Apple's App Store are not appearing on any chart, on any store, anywhere around the world, at least two out of three days. Those apps are not being found, period. The only way those apps are being found is if someone goes spear fishing for them, which is the term. It means a direct, exact search. I am looking for X, Y, Z, and then we go find that. There's no browsing for zombie apps. So, my prediction, it's been talked about a lot. My prediction is that the, the large companies are going to continue to get bigger, own more of the market. The smaller companies are going to get squeezed out.
But the reason is going to come down to one metric. And that single metric is going to be what's your cost of customer acquisition? The big companies are going to get that down to zero. They're going to use all of their own resources to cycle and cross promote and to run ads on their own TV stations or to run their ads wherever they can. And to try to compete against that is going to get really tricky. Um, let me move into the tips. This is where I go into sort of rapid fire, machine gun, boom, 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 boom. Everything that I would tell my younger self if I was starting seven years ago. Number one, passion. Yes, you absolutely have to have passion for what you're building. And there's a reason. Because there's going to be a lot of days where you're going to wake up and it's just going to suck. And if you're not passionate about it, you're not going to keep doing it. So make sure you're absolutely passionate about it. Number two, it's got to be radical. It can't just be a little bit better. It's got to be a lot better. Two times, four times, eight times, ten times better than the competitor. If you're only 10% better than the competitor, you might as well do something else. It's not enough. The low-hanging fruit is gone from this market. Find a niche, or even better, a micro-niche, and own it. Absolutely invest everything that you've got until you are the number one app in that micro niche. There is no better hair curling app for kids than the Tokoboka app, right? There's just nothing better than that one app, right? And they talked about how they rebooted their entire engine because they needed to get the curling in. And if they didn't do it, someone else was going to do it, right? Um, it seems to me, and maybe it's just an observation, but I believe that the apps that win seem to be the ones that spend the most time perfecting the minutia. And it's the minutia that, this is gonna come out, it's gonna come out two ways, it might be right both, I don't know. It's the minutia that matters. You've really gotta focus on it, in other words, you've gotta choose the right things to focus on them, and you've gotta focus on them down to that level of detail, like that pixel is off. It's what Steve Jobs did fantastically. Focus. To get into the top of any given niche takes laser focus of the value you are trying to create. It's all about the value you are trying to create and the laser focus of that value. Uh, this market is moving fast. I've been running businesses now for 22, 23 years. I've never seen anything as fast as this. I've never seen anything as competitive as this. I've never seen anything that has as low of a barrier to entry as this. And if, um, if you don't have a team that's able to move really, really fast, it's, it's a problem to be in this space. Um, the quote I would say is, the app market favors speed. If you cannot guarantee speed out of you and your team, you might want to consider something else. I believe that you have to have a solid foundation of income before you've got to play. It's almost like table stakes for your business. Um, Toka Boca had this, and they should be very, very thankful that they did. Because I believe it's one of the critical, critical pieces to their success when they write the book. They had a huge corporation behind them saying, go do what you want to do. And they were able to run and play for a year, year and a half, what did he say last night? Before they came out with their first app. Right? At Ocean Ask, we had a little bit of a different approach. I'm not saying it was any better, it was just different. We needed to get to what's called ramen profitable really fast. I don't know how many people know about Guy Kawasaki. Guy Kawasaki wrote a fantastic business book called The Art of the Start. I'm not going to dive into it other than to say, your first goal in business is to start making enough money that you can pay your family and live, or you can live on ramen. Once you can live on ramen, you can build up on top of that. And so that's where we went. We went to try to get to ramen profitable as fast as possible. Um, the danger is that VC does not provide this financial base that a lot of people think it does. Um, in a startup, there's two things that are working against you, and you've got to pay attention to both of them, and you got with laser-like focus. One of them is time, and the other one is money. And the reality is, if you run out of time or you run out of money, you're dead. Right? 
So you gotta be super efficient with your time and you gotta be like frugal, frugal, frugal with your money. Um, quarter, what can you do on a, on a ridiculously small budget? And then challenge yourself. What if I only had a quarter of that? You may not get it down to a quarter of that, but you may end up at half. And if you can end up at half of a ridiculously small budget, you might have a shot. So my, my personal belief is, um, and, and this is a total bias, and I own it and I accept it, I believe that having too much money too early, too easily, actually makes you really dumb in product decisions. And I think people think that they've won the war when they get the money in at the beginning. And I actually think that there's a lot of value in being forced to build something with a very small amount of resources. Um, yeah. And the market does seem to favor small, focused, bite-sized apps. Those laser-focused apps. How different would Toka Focus business be if all of their great products were in one app? Engines aside, would they make more money that way, or do they make more money because they have lots of small little pieces? People know exactly what they want to go get. Small is not bad. And as, as apps, if you, when you start thinking about apps and you start thinking big and grandiose, and it's going to be this entire system and this architecture and all this stuff, I argue you might be starting to think the wrong way. I strongly recommend that you keep a not list. What is not going to go into this app? Number one, it's a great place to start to figure out where you're going to start saving money. But number two, it forces you to realize that you don't want to throw everything and the kitchen sink into the app. Unless you're making Tokyo kitchen. <laughs> um, ultimately, knowing what not to put in will make your app better and it will keep your costs down. Um, Technology is really expensive. Writing that core-based technology, um, I challenge you to ask yourself, how am I going to repurpose this technology for five or 10 or 50 apps before you even start writing the first line of code? That's part of the magic of how we've been able to build Ocean House Media. We don't have 400 engines, right? We probably have 20. 25. It's not an insignificant amount, but it's not 400. I believe that you've got to be opportunistic. Um, I believe it's about building a base, uh, a financial base of wherever you can get it. It seems to me that the goal is to get enough passive income out of the app industry to give you the right to be able to start playing. At least that's the way I tackle it. So, um, I think that's important. I do believe that you have to experiment a lot. Uh, names, icons, text, features, colors, designs, concepts, prices, monetization models, brands, genres, engineers, teammates, all of them. Do I really need to experiment in all of those? Yes, I believe you do. I believe it's a business about a long tail. I don't think it's a business about the spike. I think there's a lot of people that focus on, and then I'm going to have this big crazy rush, and I'm going to buy all this advertising, and Apple's going to promote me, and it's all going to happen in the first day. And it might, and you, that might happen, but I believe that the real business and the healthy business is, what is your app doing a month after launch? How thick is that tail, and how long is it going to run? And I go back and look at the Tibetan Bowls app that we did to answer that, right? The spikes are awesome and they're fun. It's the stuff you run around the office and you're high-fiving each other. But that's not the stuff that's going to pay your mortgage two months from now. The stuff that's going to pay your mortgage two months from now is that stuff, down that way. And where are you sitting on the long tip? I believe that you have to balance the business with the creative. And there's got to be a lot of energy into it. And unfortunately, I just think there's a lot of people not wanting to do it. Maybe they're not comfortable with it. I think it's important to find someone that is. How are you going to market it? Why would you want to paint a masterpiece if you and your close friends are the only people that are ever going to see it? And that's a lot of what I see in this room. There's a lot of, and not just this room. I'm not trying to put people there. You understand what I'm saying, right? It's about 
getting that masterful work out into the world. And I would, I would challenge you that knowing that and finding that and figuring out those partners and figuring out how to get it out there become as important to painting a masterpiece in the first place. Getting the financial success will give you the opportunity to keep painting. Growth hacking. If you don't know what the term growth hacking is, I would strongly recommend that you learn. Google is a great resource, there's a great website, there's blogs, this is where the world is going. It's all about metrics, it's all about analytics, it's all about virality, it's all about daily active users, monthly active users, what's your engagement? This stuff is all starting to get built in into apps and understanding it is where it's going. Brands are important. I think you need to partner with a great one or you need to build your own. There's two ways to do it, they're both valid. But putting out a new app that's unique in its branding each time you put out an app is sort of like starting from square one every time. And I think that's the challenge. Don't forget, there's two customers, and they both have to be addressed. Um, you know what's funny is my ideal customer can't read, does not own an iPad, and has no means to pay me. But it's the person that's going to be using my app. Right? Is that my customer or is mom my customer? And at the end of the day, one has to love your app, the other has to like it enough, kind of love it, but you got to understand both and you've really got to appease both. Don't underestimate user testing and kids. I have to be honest and say we dropped the ball on this a little bit in the early days. We've changed this and we've had some eye-opening moments recently. And, um, our apps are getting a lot better than they used to be. So, um, and it's interesting. And we're doing a lot of the uh, videotape, get the face, get the finger, see what they're touching on, and see where the reactions are. And it's really interesting. And you know what, nothing, nothing made me feel better than when my lead designer walked into my office and said, there's three things we need to do. Because once the child gets this, and this, and this, in terms of how to use it, they're off and running. And it's a night and day difference between the two. And, and we ended up getting a laser focus on, got it. In the first five minutes, not five minutes, first 30 seconds, they gotta get this, they gotta get this, they gotta get this. Once they got that, they're good. They'll sit in it for half an hour or an hour if we let them. Right? But knowing that and identifying it and understanding it, um, you only get it by watching. Um, prepare to be copied. As soon as people see you making money, people will chase you, and in this space, they will chase you fast. Because everyone else is nimble, and the barrier to entry is almost nothing. We've seen it. We've seen it a lot. Um, be prolific. I believe that the only way to get true perspective in this industry is to be prolific enough to see what's working. And, uh, you know, we have kids apps, we have non-kids apps. Half of our business is not kids apps. I didn't state that up front at the beginning. Uh, I probably should have been more clear with that. A lot of our financial foundation comes from apps that have nothing to do with kids base. So we're seeing what's happening in productivity. We're seeing what's happening in health and wellness. We're seeing what's happening in a lot of other places. Um, and it's really interesting to see what's working and what's not. Um, I do think it's important to diversify. Um, you'll learn more and you'll be protected if the market collapses or if the algorithms change or if the kids category all of a sudden gets buried somewhere else on the app store. I mentioned this last night. Ultimately, I believe that the battle is not for dollars. The battle is for time. There's a lot of really good lessons to be learned if, if, if you're not familiar with what World of Warcraft did to the video game business in 2004. I would strongly recommend that you Google it and take a look. Because World of Warcraft came out as a subscription product. It was $10 a month. It took a decent amount of money away from everyone that was making $50. What it really did is like a vacuum. It sucked away the time and attention and energy from millions of gamers, and the market just went boom. Right? Um, and I believe that there's a lot of plays that are coming into the App Store that are going to be doing the exact same thing, and Warren mentioned it yesterday, with YouTube alone. Okay? Um, 
I'm running long, so let me show you a quick demo. I, I think it might be better for me to even demo this a little bit more later, but just to give you some highlights. So um, we've had to evolve, and I challenged my team. This is something, I've, I mean, this is so nuts for me, right? I went back to my team and I said, um, we've gotten long in the tooth, and our apps are not competing as well as they could. We used to get five out of five stars, and now we're getting four and a half. Maybe a little less sometimes. Act didn't change. We were still evolving it. We weren't evolving it enough. And that was, again, when I said I underestimated the speed of evolution. And so we actually, um, I challenged the designers and the programmers to sit down and say, if you were to start from scratch without any baggage, what would you do? And it's interesting because they came back with a lot of stuff that we'd already done, but they also added in a lot of new stuff. Um, and, and I'm going to, you know, Warren, your document that you just distributed to everyone with the page about enjoyment, control, interest, and feeling of competence, nails it. It nails it exactly. I was, I was prepared for this talk as your document came in. And it's like, I don't need to tell everyone what they need to put into an app to make it magical. You've already done it. It's there. And what felt good to me is when I was able to go back and connect the dots of, oh yeah, we did that. <coughs> We did focus on that one. We had missed on that one, but we think we've got it now. So um, thank you for that. I don't think folks realize the resource that that is. Um, I know you can't read it. It's too small, and the actual graph is way too big. Um, this was a graph of every digital book app that we thought was significant a year ago. And we mapped it out by price, category it was in, Feature by feature, who had what, whether they were entertainment, whether they were education, whether they were animation and interactivity. And we wanted to see where we stood against everyone. And it was really clear where we were strong, and it was really clear where we had gaping holes. And then that gave us the, the, the focus to know exactly where we needed to go. Because in 2009, when we designed the first book app, there was no competition. You know, five, six years later, there's a lot of people that were chasing at us. And it was time for us to sort of look back across the, the race course and see who else was there and really what were they doing. And they were taking advantage of our weaknesses, the things that we hadn't done. So we sort of had to go back and say, all right, it's time to play ball. And um, we gutted the engine. We started from scratch. We literally said all of that legacy code, reboot. And it's been 12 months. And what's funny is the new app, it doesn't even look so different than the old app. It's just that all the little pieces that we're missing that you want to have in, we believe we have in there now. That's why we're excited about it. Uh, that basically turned into this, which went in uh, item by item. How are we going to readdress the main menu? How are people really addressing the main menu? How fast can we get the child in? What type of instructions do we need to have? Is it going to be words? Is it just going to be a big, gigantic play button? What are we going to do with page transitions? Every decision that we had made in the past, we questioned. Is it still appropriate to have a page term? Or is that just a waste of time? And we just bring in that garbage in because that, it used to be a book, right? Everything, the amount of word highlighting, the size that the, the words were highlighting, and you know, how you're gonna repeat everything. So, I, look, I'm, I still have more I wanna talk about. I'm running out of time. Let me show you a little bit of this, and then I'm happy to show it more whenever, whenever the time is right. So, um, this is still at an alpha stage, maybe close to beta, um, but basically we're starting to get into um, animation and stuff right at the very beginning. You might remember in the beginning it used to have this read to me and autoplay and all the rest of it. Like, I mean, really, like we put, we put voiceover on it to make it a little bit better, but if I have to really, like, come on. We're teaching kids how to read, and the first thing we're doing is asking them to read a button to go forward. Uh, Daddy, which one am I supposed to hit on? Like, I heard it in my own house. It was ridiculous. Uh, borrowing from Tokoboka. Just a big play button and go. Right? It's as simple as that. The sun did not shine. It was too wet to play. So we sat in the house on a cold, cold, wet day. We do inherit the fact that we are adapting a classic. Right, and, and one of the things that we absolutely inherited and we stuck with was don't change the art and don't animate things. 
you know, the rain's going to tip based on the direction. Uh, you know, if you start tapping anywhere, you can start getting thunder and lightning. Fun, playful stuff, but it's, it's still about um, the reading. We've still got the individual words, right? Uh, I wonder, I'm going to play the text again. Pay attention as it gets over the words cold down at the bottom. The sun did not shine. So it was too wet to play. So we sat in the house all that cold, cold, wet day. Did anyone catch the difference when the words cold went by and actually shivered? Rather than just a normal highlight? So the animation system that we built in actually goes all the way down to the word level, where the designers now have the ability to animate the words in the paragraph if they're actually doing something. It's kind of borrowing. To, to give credit where credit is due, Mark, um, we're borrowing from everyone that we can borrow with. Um, you know, chimney. touching in the chimney. Of course, you're still getting the word chimney, but we've actually figured out a way to sort of do some of this. Press the uh, chimney. What you can do with the watch and press harder, oh. we can press harder on the chimney and get more chimney. Um, you got to clap for this stuff. This yeah. is good. Yeah. The, we retain the idea that tapping on things Jeez. is going to highlight, right? But if you tap on house, did anyone notice house highlighting in the in the body house. copy? Right? So we're starting to work both ways house. on the tapping. So. Some of this stuff seems a little, I don't know, it's almost like small or understated, but we believe that it's in the understatement of it that the book will still be a book, but the polish level will be high. That's our belief. Okay. Now, the other big thing that we did is we knew we couldn't add pages, but we also wanted it to make a lot. We wanted to make it a lot more engaging for kids. So we've hidden on every page learning activities, and the learning activities are scaffolding, and they take they take into account the comprehension of the word use within the book. So the child needs to learn that there's stars hidden on every page. It's one of the things that we need to learn. We haven't got, the, we haven't got that system in here. The other thing that we need to learn is that tapping on the stars will actually bring up this you choose. sort of learning moment. It's rainy. What would you bring outside with you today? And we're focusing on all of the core pieces that you have at this level of reading. Uh, you know, nothing's really a wrong answer, but there are, and this is an example where there's actually two right answers. You could bring an umbrella, or you might choose a hat. A hat, a hat. No, why didn't I think of that? What we've learned is that the kids actually love hitting the things that are wrong for their reaction based on our play testing. And we've gone back in a whole additional cycle of multiple weeks of work. We're putting a lot of development into all of the wrong answers. What is the narrator going to say? What's it actually going to do? And what we're finding is that the kids are going back in because they want to go test everything just to go see what they can go find. Um, now, I, look, let me, I'm way over my time, and I apologize. For, let me, I'm going to start to go fast, and I, I'm going to leave this available for people to play with. But, you know, in the original look at me. book... Look at me now. It just, let, me get, let me get to some of the stuff that's a little bit more. Yeah. So, you know... With my tape. Let me stop that. Um, you know, we're getting to the level of the, the taking advantage of the accelerometer and all the rest of it. I'm going to put it down. Um, everything is still playable. Uh, uh, and then we're getting to, you know, it's a, some of the page transitions are fine. We're going from one to the other. And fell on his head. He came down with a bump. Um, and then we're getting to the stuff where it's like, you know, what do I want to do here? Everything's just follow it. There's a mean for everything to be following. Um, and we lose it all. Kids love this page. Oh, there's a star. Just like before. And, uh... Dish. And then, of course, it all comes back, because every kid wants to do it four, yeah. five, six times. Right? Um, Question? Yes. Is this going to be an update, or will this be Cat in the Hat 4.0, or whatever? So um, that is the business question that we still have not yet decided. And it's a very interesting question. The question is whether or not it's going to be an update. And the question is, if someone bought Cat in the Hat, a lot of people 
people bought it on sale for 99 cents, but even at 399, and they had five or six years of enjoyment with it, should they also get this update? Or is it like you used to have a cassette, now you have a CD, and would it be outrageous of us to ask for another three or four dollars? I don't know the answer to your question yet. I probably will in a couple of weeks. Uh, question about, do you have any advice for those that make digital products and have not forecasted correctly the update effort over time? Do you have any uh, uh, rules that you work with? Do you say 20% of your yearly budget for updates or something like that, anything to go with? Uh, our budgeting works completely different than that. I would say 10, at least 10 to 15% is probably a safe bet if, you had to, if I had to guess. Of development costs. Of development costs, okay. yeah. Thanks. Um, I'm going to, let me see if I'm, I think I'm going to pause on this because I, I really do have a couple of other things I want to touch on. Um, but just to give you an idea of some of the flavor of where this is at, I mean, it's just fun as the pages are built. They are this shape. Look, you know. look, and are fit. Anyhow, um, there's tons of stuff, and, and I could play with it for an hour, and we've seen a lot of kids playing with it a lot, which is really great. Um, let me wrap on a couple of things because I do want to be respectful of time. Um, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of learning. And, um, my focus happens to be entrepreneurship and leadership and business. This is my, oh, sorry, one slide back. I hope I wasn't one slide back the whole time. Um, this is my reference catalog. This is my business book library back at, um, back at the office. And actually, I'm leaving first thing tomorrow morning to head off to MIT to finish my third year of entrepreneurial master's work with them. Um, so that's where my focus is. Uh, but I wanted to leave you with three books that I think are important. None of them are on the, on the stack over there. Um, the first book is Free. It's by Chris Anderson. He used to be the editor of Wired Magazine. I've talked about this book before. Our business was built around thinking that this is what was coming. If you haven't read this book yet, I think it's critical that you do. Um, I think it's one of the most important books that's come out in this decade. And um, I won't spoil it for you. I think it's important to read. Um, Blue Ocean Strategy, I don't know if anyone's um, read this, maybe by a show of hands. How many people have seen this book or read this book or understand it? Okay, so a couple, a handful of people. Um, there's times when a market is blue ocean and it means you can just go and, and, and make a bundle of money. And there's a time when there's so many people in the water fighting for the same fish. It's like a knife fight and the ocean turns literally red with the blood and people just fighting based on price. And that's what the App Store is today. The App Store has become a big, gigantic red ocean. And, and, and some of the, the financial economic magic is going to be in finding the spots of blue ocean inside the red. And they're there, but that's going to be a big part of it. Um, and then I'm not necessarily condoning what this book says to do, but I think it's an important read for everyone here. Um, it's a book called Hook. If I show hands, how many people have seen this book or familiar with this book? One, two, three, okay. Um, everyone's hand should be going up. Um, this book is sort of like the definitive, again, I'm not saying it's a good idea, but it is like the definitive guide on how to build a product that is totally addictive in the digital space. For kids. For kids, well, well, the thing is it applies, it's human nature, right? Um, and this is what the game designers are using to build their stuff. And um, I'm not saying to go do it, but there's some of the pieces of it that are in there. Some of it talks about unexpected rewards. I hit this and I get something unexpected. Like some of that kind of stuff, like ethically, there's nothing wrong with that. That's great stuff to do. Some of it in the book might be a little questionable. I don't recommend you go take all the advice. Um, and then really quick, 30 second pitch, my latest passion, Warren asked that I to talk about it. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm an inventor, and um, a couple of years ago, I, I designed a system called Commit to Three, and so it shows you how diverse I get in my thinking. We've actually put um, a, a lot of time and tens of thousands of dollars into an app called Commit to Three, and my goal is to help people to live better lives by getting things done. Um, in the research that I've done, the people that are most successful in their life actually decide the three things that they're going to do in the morning and then make sure those three things get done above and before everything else. That, together with team accountability, is a system that we built. I did a TED Talk based upon it. We did a website based upon it. And, um, and we had an app 
on the can you show it your watch on the camera? Yeah, I mean, I can, yeah, sure. Let me take it off because that's what I try to put my wrist down there while I'm watching this. So there's commit to three, deliver my Duster Magic talk. I got it done. Boom, that's going to check <laughs> off. Now, When they look at their dashboard, is going to see that they finished it. And actually, I'm sitting here today, and I know what my team is working on. And I know what they've selected as their three priorities, and I'm seeing if they're focused on doing what they need to do. Um, so what's next? Um, we're going to do lots of updates to all the apps. We are so excited to be done with this engine, because it's all blue sky. Coming the last week of June, we're going to go, where do we want to go? What do we want to do? Stay tuned. Um, my last comment would be about competition. And this is my view of competition. I'm borrowing it from Greg Koch, who's a very famous entrepreneur in San Diego. We built a brewing company called Stone Brewing. At Stone Brewing, they actually sell a lot of their competitors' beer, and people ask why they do that. And he said, look, anyone that is raising the awareness and level of quality in the beer brewing industry, I want to support. And anyone that's dropping the level, those are my competitors. Everyone in this room, as far as I'm concerned, the fact that you're here, the work that you're doing, the attention you're putting into it, none of you are competition. We are all collaborating to make the industry better. It's the folks that are putting out garbage, putting it out there 99 cents, tricking kids. That's the competition. Let's get those folks out of the water and let's get the ocean to be blue again. Thank you. So, page flipping or not page flipping? Have you decided to do say? They're sliding. Um, I could show it to you again. They slide left to right. So they, they do, um, it's just not a big, crazy, like, fake 3D flip. Yeah. It's just a fast transition. Can you test it out with kids? And... It's working. I mean, we just realized that we brought in the page to flip my teeth because it's what the adults were comfortable with. The kids really could care about stuff. Yeah, the page flip had nothing to do with adding magic to the product, and if it didn't add magic to the product, why have it? Uh, hi, I really like it when Duster Magic changes my mind about something, probably thanks to the ego ceremony. But I'm, I'm now totally convinced that uh, apps should come in small, bite-sized uh, quantities because of the, econo uh, the economics of it. And that through branding, uh, people like you and Coca Boca, you can, you can get them all together um, as a group in the App Store, for example, through uh, a branding. But um, on, on, the, on the quality side, on the content side, how can I get depth in an app? Uh, going, for example, uh, uh, with Dan's doodle work, where he has, uh, he has all seven of what could be seven small apps in one, uh, sorry, not Google Works, in, uh, Attributes. Uh-huh. Attributes. Attributes. Math Googles. Math Googles. It, it's the 30 IQ points just going down. Um, how can you have the depth and the fact that if you have all seven there, you're going to add to each other and, and build on each other and create a deeper and better product? Like, the, it makes, it, the yeah. small bite size makes sense economically, but the depth makes for a better app. Um, I don't know the specific answer to your question other than to tell you what we did. So a lot of the Dr. Seuss products, for example, were individual. And then pre-bundles, we did collections. So the, the, you know, the, the customer was able to decide if they wanted to buy one book or if they wanted to buy five or 10 at a discount. And it was actually a separate SKU. And then the bundles came out from Apple, which we love. Bundles are working really well. You know, I, I would challenge um, Darren to think, you know, if there were seven individual apps and they were available as a bundle, might people get one easy bite size and then do that complete my bundle to get the rest once they know they love it? Could be a different monetization way to look at it. And then once you get to a certain level of scale, and it's significant, like a lot of scale, you can actually roll up and look at possibly doing a subscription app. We now have three subscription apps on the store. One of them is on our new age self-help side called uh, Hey House Now. 
And then our book catalogs are large enough and deep enough for Little Critter and also for Dr. Seuss that each of those have a subscription app just dedicated to their books as well. But they are, you know, many dozens of literally interactive apps available. They're not just like page flipper EPUBs. They're like full, deep, rich. So uh, that's where we come. First of all, thank you. It was very interesting to hear about what you said. Uh, you said you're not spending a lot of money on app development, but you, you advise us to keep the development costs small. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I understood correctly, you said it's not about $100,000 for an app. But um, could, would you share how expensive an app is, like compared mm -hmm. to how long would it take to, to um, um, to make like I like to to make profit, like what would be acceptable for you, or um, because I know like if you if you work with other um, brands, you have to pay all the, um, the the fees as well. So sure. like how how expensive would a good app be for you? So I've spoken about this in the past, um, and it's probably worth mentioning again. And and I I, I think that. Um, one of the reasons that we've been able to be successful is because we use a totally different business model than most production companies in the world. Most of our engineers and a lot of our key folks on our apps, I don't pay. They get royalties based on the work that they've done. And that happens from Map Zero. And what it does is it creates alignment. If I talk to an engineer and I say, look, I need a book engine written, and we're going to do 20 apps based upon it, and it's got to be awesome, and it's got to be updatable, and it's got to be multi-platform, and it's got to be whatever, blah, 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 but you're going to get a percentage of the lifetime sales, I've effectively made them an equity partner, not in the business, but in the app. I have equity partners for all 400 of the apps that I have on the app store. And when Apple comes out with iOS 8 or 9 and something breaks, I don't have to make a phone call to an engineer and say, hey, this broke, how much do you want to charge me to update the 20 apps that are built on that engine? I go, hey, this broke, no one's making any money starting tomorrow unless we fix it. Which route do you think is going to be more cost effective for me and which one do you think is going to get the better product at the end of the day? I, I'm blessed now because I have engineers whose motivation in building high quality product is directly in line with my needs, right? So um, I don't assume that this is possible with every company that's out there. In fact, I assume this is probably not available for most. But this one change in our business model is what has allowed us to get to the scale that we've gotten to, right? We got that first Tibetan Bowls app done in 51 days for virtually no money because everyone that was involved was getting a percentage, right? So they each get a slice, the company gets a slice, I get a slice. We've all been able to carve up the money and everyone's been paid well on it. It also means that the engineers that are working on a project need to buy in on it. And if they don't believe that it's going to make money, they're the first folks to challenge me. Why am I going to go spend two months of my life building this if we don't think it's going to make any money? And I'd much rather get that pushback at the engineering level before we dive in, rather than after we put all that money in and put it out into the market, and then no one's going to go buy it. Last question. Um, is the Tibetan Bulls app um, a zombie app, or what percentage of your apps, your 400 apps, do you think uh, are zombie apps? It's a good question. Um, it was not a zombie app for the first three or four years. Now that it's seven years out, it probably is. Honestly, I haven't looked recently. Um, to be fair, it probably is a zombie app, but it's still generating thousands or tens of thousands of dollars a year, so I'm not that concerned about it. Uh, when I, you know, I, I, um, I think it's still priced at $1.99, I think the iPad version might be $2.99, and as I was sitting in the airport working on this yesterday, I was like, 
might be time to just drop it to 99 cents just to get it back on the charts again. I mean, all the costs have been recovered, right? I'm going to predict about 50 sales today. 50 sales? Um, yeah. Yeah. You're going to get a spike. Well, sir, thank you. Thank you.